So I've been wanting to make a video like this for a while because over the years I've been collecting a lot of weird and bizarre opening traps that I have not gone in games on stream. And I figured I'd compile a bunch of them into a single video. And I hope this brings some enlightenment, some entertainment. A lot of these are going to be really weird, bizarre traps um, that are extremely rare. Some of them are really dubious that you shouldn't really try at home. But then others are a bit more practical that uh, you can get in, in real games, uh, play against typical openings, and, and maybe score a, a few victories further down the road. So before we get into the traps, I do have to thank today's sponsor is audible.com. If you haven't heard of them, they have a massive collection of audiobooks and podcasts and really anything you can listen to, you can find on Audible. So if you want to get a free audiobook of your choice, you can use a link in the description, audible.com slash I am Rosen, or you can text I am Rosen to 500 500. Last time I did one of these, I, I gave a, a book recommendation, The Art of Learning. Um, today, I'll give another recommendation. It's called All the Wrong Moves, and it's by Sasha Chapin. This is a really, really fascinating story, um, really great listen. Sasha talks about his experience as a chess amateur and uh, developing kind of an addiction to the game, traveling around the world, competing in events. Um, he visited St. Louis, got coaching from Ben Feingold. He has so many interesting uh, stories to tell. And I think a lot of my viewers can potentially relate to his experience. So if you want to get this audiobook or any other audiobook for free on Audible, again, you can use the link in the description, audible.com slash I am Rosen or text I am Rosen to 500, 500 And let's get back into some opening traps. Okay, so this first one I discovered about eight months ago. I was playing against a Grandmaster in a bullet game. Uh, this is off stream. I was black. I'll actually flip the board because I'll, I'll share from my perspective and then we'll flip back to uh, the white perspective. I encountered the Trampowski opening and I decided to play what I thought was a really, really solid setup basically resembling a queen's gambit declined. And my opponent developed naturally. So far, nothing too weird. I played b6, very normal, to play bishop b7 and c5. And here my opponent played kind of the first peculiar move of the game, queen a4. And at first I thought, okay, maybe this is a positional idea. Opponent wants to maybe play bishop a6 and trade off white squared bishops, weaken my light squares. I just continued here, played bishop b7, and already white is scoring 82% after 95. And actually after 95, um, black is most likely to fall into the trap and blunder with taking on e5. So this is where we're gonna flip back the board and try and figure out why Knight takes e5 is actually just a losing move. And we'll play it on the board. Knight takes e5, pawn takes e5, and knight d7. So in this position, I'm going to give this as a puzzle. This is white to move. Find the absolutely crushing move, which just wins a lot of material on the spot. And here is where we see the true reason behind queen a4. Um, it was not to influence uh, the queen side, but mainly to swing over to the king side after queen h4. Black is um, in deep, deep trouble. There's a mate threat on h7, and there's also the threat of bishop takes e7, which would then consequently fork the queen and the rook. And at this point, black is already dead. Um, I did fight on for, uh, for a few more moves. I think I played g6. But after my opponent took on e7, I'm uh, I'm just going to be down a rook in the end of things and uh, I went on to lose a game. So this is a really cool one. Um, and this is one which I'm thankful I discovered because I, I won't fall for it again as black. And it's, it's really nice kind of using the whole board geometry 
uh, developing the queen this way with intention to swing the queen all the way over. And this is why queens can be so tricky, even early in the game, is uh, it can really make use of the whole board and effectively target the, the weaknesses in the opponent's position. So just to show, um, there have been almost 300 players that have fallen into this, this exact position on Lee Chess, white winning 97% of the games from here. So let's move on to the next one. Next one is going to be uh, a much weirder one. And this is one I'm, I'm going to say that you should not try at home because it's basically pure hope chess. And even if the opponent falls into it, it's not really good. Um, but I'm just showing this for more entertainment purposes. So this one I'm calling the dumb queen e7 trap. And it emerges after normal king's pawn on move two, black will play queen e7. And normally this is uh, just a really bad positional move. Usually you should not develop your queen this early, and especially to e7 where you block in the bishop. But there is um, kind of a deeper tactical idea. And I, I became aware of this a few years ago. Then I forgot about it. And then in trying to think of traps for this video, I, uh, I remembered it and figured I would include it. So the potential trap white can fall into is when white tries to play a so-called fried liver attack with bishop c4 and knight g5. So if we imagine bishop c4, knight f6, knight g5, this is already not a great move for white. And after black's next move, white is going to be in a bit of a predicament. Um, surprisingly enough, black can play h6 and provoke white to take on f7. And incredibly, it's not good for white to take on f7 with either the bishop or the knight due to some tactical reasons. Um, if bishop takes f7, this is a simpler line, black plays king d8, and all of a sudden the knight is attacked, knight is also tied down to defending the bishop, black is just winning a piece here. Even though we lost casting rights, we can turn on the engine and engine will say black is, oh, it's already, yeah, minus three. So almost no compensation for white. Um, where it gets murkier is if white takes with a knight on f7. And this actually turns into a kind of a chaotic position. But the point is black can play rook h7. And now this knight is a bit stuck. And uh, Black's next move is going to be pawn d5. And very likely the knight will be lost. Now this position, if we look on the chess, white still scores well here after the move pawn d4. And if we turn on the engine, the engine will say um, like it's close to equal. Like Black has to play somewhat precisely. Actually, the engine's a bit confused here on, uh, on what to do. I guess we can play d6 or maybe even takes on d4, maintaining the idea of d5. But the positions here get really murky, and it's the type of thing I probably wouldn't recommend studying too deeply, um, just given that you shouldn't be playing this opening trap too often. But it's a cool idea, especially because um, after knight f6, knight g5 has been played over 400 times, and um, it's it's kind of a surprise when h6 comes and white is not better according to the engine. So let's move on to the next one. So this next one is going to feature a really cool tactical idea emerging from kind of a bizarre line in the Karo Khan. So the moves start e4, c6, d4, d5, uh, mainline Karo Khan, knight c3, trade on e4, and now knight f6. I know if you ever watch uh, Gotham Chess play Blitz, this is one of his favorite lines in the Karo Khan for black. And the main line here is to take on f6, but the secondary move is knight to g3. And after knight g3, black can pressure white right away. And we should actually look from black's perspective because it will be black trapping white in just a few more moves. Black can be ultra aggressive, play pawn h5, 
um, threatening to play pawn h4 and further kick around the knight. So if we imagine white still tries to play actively, goes for bishop g5, which has been played a number of times before. Black plays h4, white trades on f6, but instead of taking back the bishop, black takes the knight, now white saves the bishop. This brings us to a really unusual position where it is equal material, but black has a pawn on g3, the h file is half open, and it is black to move. And I will say from this position, there is a really, really just breathtaking tactical idea that I do encourage viewers to find. So if you want to take your time, feel free to pause the video and find the amazing sequence for black in this position. So I will say there's actually two winning moves, um, but both of them use the same idea. And it's just a matter of, kind of deciding which move order that you want to play. But we are going to see a queen sacrifice. And I think the easiest move to start with is to take on h2, where we hit the rook. Um, if white doesn't want to lose a rook on h1, white has to take back. And now we're in an interesting situation because we would love to take back and then try and promote. But if we take back too soon, white will just take back and it's a fair trade. So this is where we play an in-between move or what the Germans call Zwischenzug. And we start with queen a5 check, hitting the king, but also hitting the bishop. This is just as important because after white blocks a check, imagine pawn c3, we sack our queen for the bishop. Oh no, my queen. And after white takes back, we now take the rook. And this pawn is guaranteed to promote. And the queen is guaranteed to be reborn. If knight f3, oh yes, my queen. Or if queen h5, preventing h1, queen, we just take the knight and promote. And whatever happens, black will be up material. So this is a really cool one, especially really before move 10 to force a line where we sack our queen to guarantee promotion. I'll share one more kind of cool variation here. If after queen a5, queen d2, the best move for black is to use a very nice deflection tactic and take on f2 exploiting the fact the king is tied down to the queen. So if takes, we win the queen. And um, of course, the queen can't take because it's pinned to the king. And if king e2, we can then trade queens and then take and promote and uh, be absolutely crushing in this position. So this is a nice one, um, not one that you'll see every day. Most players won't go into this line as white. But if we look on the Lee Chess database, we can see this has happened actually a few times where it looks like a few of the players did go into this rook h2, rook h2, queen a5, uh, c3, and yeah, all seven players who reached this position knew to take on e5. So good job to these people. And maybe there can be a few more games added to the list after this video is posted. So let's move on to number four. This next one, I have a story to go along with the trap. Uh, it was a few years ago, I played an over the board blitz tournament against a grandmaster. And before the game, they kind of stumbled into the playing hall. They almost showed up late, which usually you shouldn't do for a, a blitz tournament. And uh, they were carrying a glass of wine. Didn't appear to be so sober, and the opening also was a bit weird. Uh, they played the Alakheim, which is a legitimate opening. But um, after a few moves, like c6 was a bit offbeat. And I played c4. And uh, my opponent played knight to b4. And I could tell my opponent was like, not so focused, looking around. And I thought they were just uh, in a, a very bad frame of mind, uh, especially to be playing a serious chess game. So without too much thought, I went ahead and played a3 in this position. 
And I should note, I was rated over 2200 at the time. So I was a master level player, um, but I, I still walked into what, uh, what we can call an elementary trap. And as it turns out in this position, A3 is a blunder and it walks straight into the trap. And now it's black to move. How can we actually make use of the knight on b4? When I played a3, I was expecting the knight to go back to a6. But black has a way to win material in this position. If you don't see the move immediately, feel free to pause the video and find the way black can win material here. And if you're guessing queen takes d4, you would be absolutely right. Queen d4 is actually a really aesthetic in-between move, uh, kind of a counterattack. Um, hitting the knight, but also temporarily sacking the queen if white were to take it. Black strikes back with a triple fork. And okay, if king d2, knight takes d4, black has one a pawn in the process and has a very fine position. So queen takes d4 uh, just wins a, a, a clean pawn. Um, I think my opponent was kind of acting during the game, like the, the glass of wine. Um, was maybe there to, to make me underestimate my opponent, but um, I, I had to learn the hard way. And it was another one of these times where once I, I fall into the trap once, I won't fall into it again. And we can see on Lee Chess, this is actually a somewhat common trap. Over a thousand people, almost 1500 people have uh, been victims of this uh, from the white side. And it does turn out if we go back uh, just a couple moves. The best move is to delay c4 and play bishop e2, complete development, and then save c4 for later. After c4, knight b4, white's already under pressure here because uh, we can't play a3. Queen takes d4 is already a threat. The engine will say it's uh, it's approximately equal here, and it's actually easy for white to, to go wrong in, in some of these lines. Um, and after bishop e3, Black scores quite well after bishop f5, keeping initiative and, um, and generating some activity. So this is actually not a bad line for black, and especially in faster time controls. If you do play c6, c4 is one of the most popular moves from white. And uh, if we look at the stats in this position, the most played move on Lee Chess is pawn a3. So white would be quite likely to fall into the trap from this position. So there's a few lessons to take away from this one. Um, of course, you should always be tactically alert in the opening, especially when your opponent is playing weird moves like this. Uh, you should always ask yourself, what potential tactics does opponent uh, want to do? And you should never judge your opponent based on how sober they may or may not be. So let's move on. And this next one is, uh, is a cool one. This is going to be a calculation exercise. And it's based off a game I played a few years ago against Grandmaster Steven Zirk. And what I'm going to show did not actually happen in the game. It was more of just an interesting kind of sideline that I, I thought of during the game. So I was white. We went into kind of a sideline of a French defense. Um, and then entered what, uh, I don't even know, I guess Lee Chess calls this the, the Winnerer variation, Alakine Marazzi Gambit. Um, this resembles kind of a, a Rubenstein variation of a French. And we reached a position where I was feeling good, had some active knights, a bit more space. My opponent responded with knight gf6. And in this position, I had a decision to make, whether to take the knight, maybe defend my knight, uh, play a move like knight g5. So I was taking time here. And the first move I, I really wanted to play was knight g5. Um, now, in a blitz game, I would probably play this relatively quickly because it has a cool threat of knight takes e6. And if we play it out, knight g5, imagine black is negligent, plays h6, we can go in and very nicely trap the queen. Um, now, this is not the line I went for. And I want to go back to this position because before I play knight g5, I have to, of course, calculate what 
black will do. And the calculation I made was, was castling is one of the most natural moves. And then I was thinking, can I get away with taking on e6? Because after pawn takes e6, knight takes e6, the queen is not quite trapped, but after queen e8, I would have knight takes e7, forking the rook and the queen. And if you calculate just this far, it looks like um, there, there's some perhaps promise for white, a lot of initiative, even though white sacked a knight, uh, I've won a few pawns in the process, probably winning winning some more material with the rook in the corner. Um, so for the people watching, I want you to try and visualize this line. So one more time, knight g5, castling, takes e6, takes e6, takes e6, queen e8, knight takes e7. Try and really visualize the position and remind me later and find the way in which black would continue after knight c7. I'll, I'll remove the arrows just in case that makes things cleaner. And um, if you need more time, feel free to pause the video. But I will say the, the reason why this line doesn't work is because after knight c7, black has checkmate in one. And I remember... Uh, when I realized it during the game, I uh, I've, uh, I've probably physically smiled, physically smiled, mentally smiled, because um, it's not the type of idea that you see every day or visualize every day. But I will play this out on the board in case some people are struggling. If I did go into this line and took on c7, this would be really, really tragic for white. And uh, the maiden one is not to move the queen, but to unleash the queen, play bishop b4, double check, and mate, because I have no way to move the king, no way to block. You, you cannot block a double check in chess, and this would be game over. So thankfully in the game, I didn't go for that. And uh, instead, I took on f6. It was still a fight. The game ended in a draw. But then um, when I was preparing for this video, I checked the Lee Chess database and knight g5 is the most played move. 10 people castled. And then one sad soul took on e6, took on c7, and got mated just like this. So there's been only one victim on Lee Chess in this trap. Um, maybe there will be more after this video, but it's another reason why you should be very tactically alert in the opening and really try and think ahead before you, you run into trouble in lines like this. So let's move on to chapter number six. This next one I only discovered within the last week. Um, I was browsing the chess subreddit and I couldn't find the original post um, that I came across, but there is a, a screenshot of a trap against the Smith Mora, which I had never seen before, which I thought was really cool. So I figured I would show it in, in the series. Um, out of all the traps, I feel like this one is maybe the most likely that people have actually seen before. But for those who haven't, um, it's a trap where you can play as black and win material in less than 10 moves. So um, this is mainline Smith Mora. Black is going to accept the gambit and then employ a setup with e6 and bishop to b4. And I hadn't seen this before because uh, bishop b4 is, is just not a line I've, I've looked into. I usually play knight c6, which is a bit more uh, classical of a move. But after bishop to b4, if we follow the most common moves from white, most common is bishop c4. Black can play queen c7 here. And then over 2,800 people played queen e2, which turns out to be a blunder. And I remember the Reddit post, it was actually talking about one way to find opening traps is to use a Lee Chess database and look for variations where there's a very high scoring percentage for one player. So we can see after queen e2, Black is scoring 57%, um, which 
uh, especially early in the opening, that's kind of an anomaly. And for good reason, after queen to e2, black has a really nice tactical shot. And again, if you want to pause the video and find the way black can win material in this position, feel free to do so. Okay, so if you still don't see it, at the very least, you should be aware of what we're looking to target in this position. The bishop and the knight are under a good deal of pressure from black's bishop and queen. And the key uh, idea here is just to apply a bit more pressure so white uh, will crumble on the queen side. And the way to do that is to thrust the b pawn forward to b5, um, hitting the bishop but also exploiting the pins in the position. Uh, we can say that there's two pins here. The knight is pinned to the king. Um, this is an absolute pin, but there's also a relative pin. This bishop, in some sense, is pinned to the knight. So if the bishop were to take on b5, black will take on c3, and after it takes, takes, black is uh, hitting the king and the rook, and this is already a decisive advantage for black. So after b5, the computer will say black has a close to winning advantage. Um, I guess uh, the best move is to take. If the bishop moves anywhere else, we're still gonna take with the same tactical ideas. So if we dig in a bit closer here, takes, 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 um, the best try for white is to, I guess, sadly give away the rook and castle. That's interesting. The, the computer says minus 1.4 after knight d2, but then it, it immediately says um, minus 3. Maybe it's still a bit confused working through some of the complications, um, but this is a, a winning advantage for black. You should be careful with the queen um, as long as you don't blunder or get your queen trapped and complete development. You should be having very good odds to, to win the game. So this is a nice and simple one. I might even try it myself uh, whenever I encounter the Smith Mora. And the one last thing I'll say, if you do go into this line, if we go back to when black plays bishop to b4, this is a slightly offbeat move. And if you're gonna play this line, you have to be prepared for queen d4, which is a bit unpleasant, hitting the bishop, hitting the queen. And then if I were to study this opening seriously, I would either prepare the line takes, takes, knight f6, e5, knight c6, which is uh, maybe slightly better for white, but still playable. There's also kind of a funny move, bishop f8, which is a computer's top choice. So um, one thing when you go for opening traps, you should also be prepared for when the opponent doesn't fall into the trap and still have some idea of what to do and know how to avoid getting in trouble. Okay, let's move on to chapter number seven, which is one that I actually discovered from a friend who sent me a DM on Instagram. And my friend discovered this trap from another friend named Dewberry. So we're gonna call this a Dewberry trap. And after a little bit of research, I discovered that Magnus Carlsen could have been a victim to this trap. He actually walked straight into it, but then his opponent didn't play the, the crushing move. So the trap starts as a Sicilian accelerated dragon, very popular variation. Um, White's gonna play the main line, kind of going for a, a Yugoslav setup. And in this position, if we look at the stats on the chess, uh, most common move by far is knight f6. But the fourth most popular move is actually a very big blunder. And it has been played almost 30,000 times online, um, including by Magnus Carlsen, who we see. Oh, we don't see. This is Dr. Nitrostein 2554. Oh no, so this was just clickbait. Oh, I, I, I was doing a bit of prep earlier and just assumed Carlsen walked into this but it's one of these Carlson imposter accounts. Never mind. Um, but maybe maybe Carlson will still have some potential to fall into this someday. Uh, let's, let's just remove that. Sorry for the, the clickbait or fake news. Anyway, that doesn't take away from the, the beauty of the next move. 
And after a6, um, white has a lot of different moves here. And I'm going to hide this for now. Um, the, the best move from white is actually the ninth most popular move played on Lee Chess. And uh, it's somewhat computer inspired. But if you do want to find it, feel free to pause the video and try and find the really nice uh, tactical aggressive move white can play in this position. And for this one, I will again reveal the opening book and we'll count down. So it's not queen d2, not bishop c4, not bishop e2, not f3, not knight takes c6, not any pawn moves, but it's knight to d5. And this is actually this is another case where we can kind of sense that this is uh, the trappy move based on the score for white out of the 468 games that featured knight d5. White scores 86%. And the reason why this move is so powerful is because it immediately targets this very weak b6 square. And uh, it has the threat of taking on c6 and then playing bishop to b6. So if black tries to develop normally, we can take and whatever pawn black takes back with, let's say d pawn. Actually, if b pawn takes, we trap the queen. So this would be nice. And if d-pawn takes, we still play bishop e6, queen d7, knight c7, and we're winning some nice material. So it turns out after knight d5, black's in really big trouble because um, there's not too many ways to remedy the, the issue of this, uh, this really weak b6 square in black's territory. Another attempt would be knight takes d4, but this just runs into bishop takes d4, and black is still having a massive headache here. Uh, we're still threatening to do nasty things on the queen side. And if takes, takes, this is just complete domination for white. If we ask Stockfish, it's already giving a decisive advantage. Um, yeah, we can have some fun kind of exploring some of these lines. Knight f6, knight b6, rook b8, e5. White just continues to throw punches and laugh at the fact that black's pieces are pretty much in shambles so i think the best move again if we ask the engine after knight d5 uh, best move is bishop to e5 which is not a move you usually want to play uh, early on in the dragon because now the bishop becomes a target and uh, the move I, I think i would prefer here is f4 just targeting the bishop force it move, to move back to c7 and this is again just nice domination white might not be winning material immediately but after a move like queen f3 white is uh is really just dictating play um controlling the center finishing development and having a, a very very pleasant position moving forward so this is a nice one um to capitalize on a somewhat offbeat move and special thanks again to Dewberry for uh, being responsible of making me aware of this trap. Okay, moving on to the very last trap I have in store. And I'm not sure if we're saving the best for last, but uh, we're definitely saving the weirdest for last. And for this last one, I have to give full credit to international master Opperwizen um, for I think being the only player ever to unleash this trap. And he's actually had it on four separate occasions on Lee Chess. We're gonna see a seven move game where he sacks his queen for mate. And it's gonna be a very, very bizarre sequence. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide the notation and we're gonna see how the play strangely unfolds. Starts with knight c3. Uh, does this opening have a name? The Van Giet opening. Um, a bit offbeat, but not too weird just yet. Black plays g6. Now he plays d3, getting a little bit weirder. Bishop g7. And now queen d2. Okay, this is starting to look very strange. Um, but it is played with some purpose. Black plays e6. And I will say, I I did not talk to Opera Wizen directly, but I have a feeling that he created this trap because he knew some opponents default to this kind of weird setup kind of the start of a hippo opening 
And when black employees is set up, it does create some opportunity to exploit the weak dark squares. And we're gonna see how white does that after knight to e4, knight e7. Here's where white setup is going to begin to make some sense. And we're gonna see the reason white played queen d2 is to throw the queen all the way across the board to h6. And uh, already this is actually a kind of a, a work of art. Um, we're gonna look in the database there have been four games with bishop takes h6. Oh no, his queen. Um, they've all been played by Opera Wesson. And from this position, white has checkmate in two after knight f6, king f8, bishop h6, checkmate. Uh, very cool mating idea. He's actually played this, uh, looks like seven times. And as far as I can tell, all the games have uh, have been his. So the more frequent move here is castling. And if we ask Stockfish what's going on, it does give an, uh, a pretty healthy advantage to black, but this doesn't stop Opera Wesson from playing it. And all of the games here has been against the same opponent. Um, he had one other game I do wanna show after queen h4, d5, knight f6, king h8 was played and uh, tragically black got mated in eight moves. So looks like this opponent, Kostya Kornienko, um, has been victimized a couple of times in, in this opening. I should also note, um, if we view the game on Lee Chess, this was Ultra Bullet. I think all of the games Opera wasn't played this were in Ultra Bullet. So um, probably not the type of trap to use in slower chess, but sometimes when the time control is quicker, you can get away with doing really crazy stuff like throwing your queen to h6 on move five. So that wraps things up for the traps in this video. I do have a few questions for the audience actually. Um, let me know in the comments what your favorite trap was. If you've seen any of these traps before, because I, I did try to, to have some more fresh content that uh, has not been covered in my streams or elsewhere. And let me know what you would like to see in future videos if you want me to make another opening traps video like this, or if there's specific openings that you want me to cover. I'd love to hear some feedback. And also let me know if you have any questions. And um, I will leave a link to the study in the video description if you want to explore these lines and analyze a bit further with Stockfish or the opening book. And with that, I will see you guys in the next video.